in Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to another edition of Apex Express, bringing you an Asian and Asian American diaspora perspective from around the world. I'm your host and producer tonight, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. On tonight's show, we unpack the historic farmer protests in India that have been ongoing for nearly two months now and is probably one of the largest protest movement in modern history. Later in the show, guest producer Diana Cab Cabin exposes the health inequities around the pandemic particularly around how Asian American communities in the state have been impacted. Stay tuned. Earlier this week, India's Supreme Court has stayed the implementation of the highly contested farm laws that seek to deregulate agricultural markets in India. The laws have triggered historic ongoing protests outside of the capital, New Delhi, and around the country since late November. India's Supreme Court has appointed a committee to hear farmers' grievances. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said he would not repeal the laws while farmers have vowed to keep protesting as long as needed. And so we begin tonight's South Asia Spotlight with a critical dialogue between two tremendous grassroots organizers from the U.S. and India, on the ongoing farmer protests. What are some of the transnational learnings that can be had from this historic moment? How can movements build and lean on each other beyond basic solidarity? How must worker and environmental justice movements draw from the past and the present to move forward into the future? To discuss this and more, we have Edgar Franks from the US and Ashlesha Khadse from India. A quick bio of these two tremendous activists before we play the conversation, uh, an edited version of the conversation I had with them last night. Edgar Franks is the Washington State Campaign and Political Director for Familias Unidas por la Justicia, where he works with union leadership and allies in the development and implementation of the Just Transition Framework that centers food sovereignty and worker organizing in innovative models of participatory democracy, such as people's movement assemblies and tribunals. Edgar has strong farm worker roots in Washington, where he grew up. Ashlesha Khatse is the Asia and Pacific Regional Director of Thousand Currents, a Bay Area-based social justice funder. She's based in Goa, India, and over the last decade has been involved in a number of social movement alliances and organizations linked to food and farmers' movements, including La Via Campesina's Agroecology School in South India. She completed her master's at El Colegio de la Frontera Sur, or ECOSUR, in Chiapas, Mexico, where she conducted research on how peasant movements scale up agroecology. Welcome, Ashlesha and Edgar, to uh, Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. Uh, so, Ashlesha, we'll begin with you. Um, can you begin by sharing... Uh, very broad, big picture, bird's eye view of the ongoing historic farmer protests in India, especially in the light of the the government, the Supreme Court's decision. Yeah, sure. I can just give you a kind of a what, where, how, when kind of an overall story first. So these protests began one and a half months ago. So that in itself is incredible that the farmers have been camped on the borders of Delhi for the last month and a half. And the reason they started is because the Indian government um, basically used its emergency powers during COVID uh, and they passed these three controversial farm laws. And while they did that, they flouted all parliamentary procedures. So there was no consultation with farmers and the parliament members were completely opposed to this. And all state governments were in rebellion because agriculture is supposed to be a state subject in India. We have a federal um, kind of government here. So the And what the laws did is they increased corporate control um, and at the same time, uh, they increased centralization, which is taking away powers from the state. And now the central Modi government wants to have everything in its hands. 
So that led to a very uh, much anger amongst the farmers' movements in India. And they saw this as a complete attack on their very existence because in the past, farmers had some kind of government protection. There was regulation of corporations. They can't just directly go and buy from farmers without offering them a fair price. Minimum prices were announced. And there were problems with that system as well. And farmers were waiting for some reforms within that system. But instead, the Modi government just threw out that entire system and then imposed the corporatization, basically ending all regulation of corporates. And they said that this is for your own good. So this is the kind of story behind the protests. Um, and the farmers are camped in three major areas on the borders of Delhi. They've blocked highways going into Delhi. Um, and they are allowing ambulances and other important vehicles to pass through. So they're not causing any disruption to people in Delhi. And the interesting thing about these protests is that they are absolutely nonviolent. Um, and the violence has come has been coming only from the government side. So the government has been very brutal. They've used water cannons, tear gas. They've been hitting farmers. They've tried to set up so many barricades while farmers were walking to Delhi. Even now, they're trying to do that as more and more farmers pour in. Um, and the government has also used uh, mediatic violence. So the government has been labeling farmers as militants, as separatists, as terrorists, and all this kind of nonsense. And, and basically, it has not stuck. Uh, their attempts have failed um, and farmers are at the moment holding the moral high ground and the respect of Indian society. Um, and these protests, are they are unprecedented because of the kind of support that has come in from the middle classes uh, of Delhi and of North India, of students, of environmentalists, of trade unions. Um, and, and there's been a lot of class, uh, what I call uh, cross-class and cross-caste we can talk more about that and also support from women. Um, so there have been lots of differences and splits in the farmers groups and there has been class contradictions, conflicts in the rural countryside. But for this protest, everybody has put aside their differences um, and they've decided to join hands um, because they see the struggle of rural India against the corporates and, and against the authoritarian regime as the major struggle at this point in time. Non-violent in a time of a pandemic, people just rallying together, um, and the kind of stories that have been coming out on the ground that social media has captured has just been unimaginably. Just really was like mind blowing yeah. to watch it. And just imagine the kind of logistics required yeah. to feed and house, uh, and yeah. so many people on a day-to-day -day basis to clean, to wash clothes, you know, to ensure that people have chargers to charge their phones and, and it's also been really uh, painful because it's one of the coldest winters and Delhi is a, it goes up to I don't know it's not as cold as in some parts of the US but it does go down to zero um, yeah sometimes it's really cold yeah. and there's yeah. raining and at the same yeah. time it started raining and so there was floods yeah. in these protests and despite that you know the farmers have said mm -hmm. that come rain or shine we're not moving from here right and uh, at this point, I would like to invite Edgar into the conversation. Edgar, welcome and share with us your work that you've been doing around organizing farm workers in the U.S. And, you know, also what have been some of the learnings or inspiration that has sparked for the work you all do as you've been tracking? Um, yeah, watching these protests, I think, um, are, you know, they're, um, a reminder of the power that people have, especially rural people in, in, in rural areas. I think here in the U.S. context, I think um, um, I think we take it for granted. The people that live um, in rural areas, you know, we call them rednecks and and hicks and blah blah blah. But it's also where a, much, a big part of the economy and uh, you know is generated. Um, a lot of the profits for, it, especially now for these big mega farms that are that have been so prevalent and, and hurting the small family farms. Um, but yeah, that um, hearing all that and the work that is being done to to amplify and and mobilize the the message of the the farmers and the farm workers is something that um, we're really inspired by. Um, um, you know, because here we're always as a we're 
I'm part of an independent union um, of around 500 members or so. Um, and when we hear, you know, of these kinds of things, it really inspires us because we know we're, we're not alone in, in the fight um, and for, for fighting for dignity for, for farm workers and, and, you know, bettering the food system and, you know, for small family farmers. So hearing this and um, seeing the pictures and the videos and, you know, the, the tenacity of, of, of the farmers and the workers together, I think served as a, a big inspiration for us and something that um, we can learn from um, as we, you know, the, the social movements in the U.S. Um, are in flux right now with the political situation that's been happening here. Um, but, you know, seeing these things that make, um, um, gives us a, a, a chance that knowing that we can organize and be effective, even in challenging times and desperate times of, of mm. uh, political uncertainty and, um, and the time of COVID. So, uh, yeah, and it's definitely something that we want to learn from and also help amplify here and in our communities. Uh, it's very rare, you know, that our media covers anything outside of, of, of the United States. But so um, mm -hmm. I think just because of, of how important these fights are, um, I think um, the media has no other choice than to cover it at, you know, at some kind of level. Um, um, and, you know, and that helps, you know, that helps also lift up the work here and ask the question of what are we doing locally to protect farm workers in, in our area, and agricultural workers and people in rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, you know, and some of the fights that we've been involved here as a farm worker union, um, mm -hmm. you know, we've done boycotts against um, you know, large corporations and, you know, we won a union contract after three and a half years of fighting. Um, and this was during the time of the rise of white nationalism and um, anti-immigrant sentiments. Um, our union is majority immigrants. Um, um, so we were able, after for three and a half years of, of organizing and getting our message out, we were able to be successful, but it was a you know, in reality, it was a a small a small victory against a band, against a big corporation. But you know, it was something that I think inspired workers um, all throughout the West Coast and the nation. As you know, it could be done in the United States, especially um, people that have been marginalized for 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 a long time, immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, and so we. Um, we think that the conditions exist for, you know, for farm workers to, to organize and mobilize and, um, really, you know, show the kind of force that, um, it's happening in India. Um, mm -hmm. I think the conditions are there. I think the only thing that's lacking is the leadership, um, and the clarity of, of a vision of a unified vision of, where we want to go. Um, I think we're starting to see a little bit, um, mm -hmm. especially around the time of COVID, um, about protecting the health and safety of farm workers, and, you know, because agencies and the government definitely not going to do that. So only, only the people can look after um, the people. So, you know, we're, we're in this moment right now of, uh, re-envisioning what a farm worker, a modern day farm worker movement looks like in the United States. That one that is not just contained um, within the U.S., but has the potential of, you know, aligning and being in solidarity with international movements like the one in India. <laughs> ਅੱਜ ਕਿੰਨੇ ਦਿਨ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਬਾਰਡਰਾਂ ਤੇ ਬੈਠਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਭ
ਚੁੱਪ ਸੀ ਚੁੱਪਿਆਂ ਚੁੱਪ ਰਵਾਂਗੇ ਉਹ ਤਬਕਾ ਝੱਲਿਆ ਨਹੀਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਿਕੰਦਰ ਵਰਗੇ ਦਾ ਤੇਰਾ ਚੱਲਾਂਗੇ ਜੇ ਸਾਡੀਆਂ ਜ਼ਮੀਨਾਂ ਖੋਏਗੀ ਆ ਤੇਰਾ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਮੱਲਾਂਗੇ ਸਭ ਰਾਜਾਂ ਪਿੱਛੇ ਬੈਰੀ ਗੇਟ ਪਾਏ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਜੱਟ ਨਹੀਂ ਪੰਜਾਬੋ ਇਹ ਆਏ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਵਿਕ ਗਏ ਆਪਾਂ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਦਾ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਆ ਬੀਬੀਸੀ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਝੋਟੇ ਛਾਏ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਸਭ ਰਾਜਾਂ ਪਿੱਛੇ ਬੈਰੀ ਗੇਟ ਪਾਏ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਜੱਟ ਨਹੀਂ ਪੰਜਾਬੋ ਇਹ ਆਏ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਵਿਕ ਗਏ ਆਪਾਂ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਦਾ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਬੀਬੀਸੀ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਜੱਟ ਛਾਏ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ a punjabi song track called kisan anthem kisan means farmer in hindi and punjabi you're listening to apex express the only south asian and asian american focused show on kpfa 94.1 fm and online at kpfa.org ashley so i was wondering if you had any specific questions to edgar around the kind of work that they've been doing in mm-hmm. in the us Yeah, I think uh, I have questions for Edgar around you know what's going on with in the US because I think the model that's being fed to farmers in India right now is that we we are trying to ape the model in the United States mm-hmm. and I think it comes from this general paradigm that the less uh people are involved in agriculture and the more they are involved in industry that is somehow a sign of a developed country and in the US of course historically i've seen that a lot of farms have closed down and only about 1 and 1/2% of the population is engaged in agriculture uh and in india it's about 60% and they are trying to go in the same direction farmers are happy in the US so i really want to know from edgar what is the situation I also read that debt is very common amongst farmers and there's also the rural farm suicide in the US is higher than the normal population so there is some kind of a crisis as well and I wonder if yeah I think that's exactly right what's happening in the US where uh we used to have you know family size to mid scale farms and those are disappearing I think if I, my uh memory serves correct I think in the United States a thousand farms go out of business or um every is it every week or something like that it's like it's like an incredible number um and a lot of these big uh corporations Monsanto uh, if you're in, in doing poultry it's you know like Tyson and um and all these big beef, beef producers and um they start buying up all these farms um but you know they start doing kind of like almost like a share cropping model um and a heavily industri- industrialized way of producing food that's not good for for the environment you know releases um a lot of pollutants into water and to the air and it's inhumane um not only for um um the animals um the way they get treated and the land and the way that the food is produced but also for for the workers um just putting a uh, tremendous amount of stress on 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 the workers so but yeah and you know when workers do try to organize um farm owners mm-hmm. um or their managers do say you know well, like we can get a machine that can pick all these berries mm-hmm. um you know we're just giving you this job right now because we're trying to be nice to you but there's been Mm. um the last couple of years there has been a move especially in in berries and apples um things that are usually hand harvested mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. to move into mechanization um mm-hmm. which is displacing um thousands and thousands of workers and i think more mm-hmm. and more companies are looking into technology 
as a way to solve their um, um, their labor problems. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it has ramifications because then you displace workers that had depended on these these jobs for many many years, or workers competing uh, asked to you know produce more than physically capable of um, to you know to stop the threat of of a machine taking their job. Um, so um, these are kind of some of the on the ground issues. You know, we also have structural issues here um, where it pits worker against the worker, um, especially in the H-2A guest visa program for agricultural workers um, mm -hmm. as a way of importing um, workers from other countries to to work in the fields here, um, mm -hmm. which also displaces a lot of workers that have been, like my family that has been working in the, in the fields for generations. Um, so there's a move by farmers to use this H-2A visa program because it is so one-sided to the employer um, as a way to extract more labor from workers mm -hmm. while paying them less. So, okay. yeah, the I think mm -hmm. the industry is definitely very advanced um, here in the United States and using technology and um, any kind of um, measure that they can uh, institutionally to really keep at bay um, uh, a farm worker movement um, from organizing. So, you know, and you get the, not brown, 60 to 70% of the workforce is undocumented if you're doing an agriculture here. So there's a hesitancy to really be public about mm -hmm. um, of your organizing or your tactics or taking on a farm and, and because of fear of deportation. So that serves yeah. as another check. But yeah, we're, um, um, like we said, I think that the, the conditions that are laid out in front of us um, are, are perfect for a time to, to organize and to really think about what 21st century organizing with farm workers looks like. And I think a lot of that does entail working with small and family farmers, something that we haven't done much in the past because of how you were saying there's those um, class conflicts. Yeah, I mean, hearing you talk, Edgar, I'm just like, how fascinating and disturbing it is that there are different intersections, right? In the US, it's about immigration, um, whereas in India, it's caste and gender that are the very strong lens through which we need to look at this issue, right? So, so given this reality, like how, you know, while on the one hand, there is a lot of parallelism between what's unfolding in India and what has happened in the U.S. around agriculture and its industrialization and its devastating consequences, what can be the lessons learned that from the U.S.'s experience that we can then use to map on to keep this going? Because now we have had like a temporary victory, but what next, right? And that is my question to you. Like, what are the next steps as this movement continues in India? And how can global and international movements, mm -hmm. including in the U.S. here, um, support these in beyond solidarity, right? There is the solidarity piece, but how can we really build the momentum in because capital i was telling edgar earlier like capital just flows freely and is always co-opting and growing right the way tech companies have and so Hello. many other the current transnational times we live in but labor and yeah. other movements have not have are yet to do that so in that sense i was interested in seeing ashlesha how can you know global movements be more intentionally supportive of what's happening in move, in India around these movements? Yeah, so uh, specifically around these protests, or uh, I can say that international the larger solidarity. Movement. Yeah. Um, so this movement is very, I would say it's, it's not what the usual movement is. It's very different. The whole face of the farmer movement has changed in these last one month because I don't think the farmer movement had asserted itself in this way. And as I said, there were different factions. Each one was 
doing its own thing. There have been lots of splits. The labor movement has been organizing separately. Um, women were, you know, missing in all pieces. Um, and and what we're seeing now is a kind of solidarity being built uh, because the common enemy is now uh, the corporate and the authoritarian state. So we are seeing a change in the face of the farmer movement as well. And in terms of global solidarity, I think um, it's very, very critical at this juncture. Uh, some people have been asking me how they can support the movement, whether they should, you know, send funding. And one important point to note for all our listeners is that funding is actually being used by the Indian government to delegitimize uh, social movements in general. And any social movement that receives any foreign funding, even if it's for an individual, they, they say foreign funded movement and somehow it's not legitimate and they use it legally to ban the protests. So if, in terms of these protests, you know, farmers movements have requested international solidarity more in terms of raising uh, awareness within their own countries through the media, I like this conversation that we're having now, uh, mm -hmm. and also pressurizing their own uh, governments to then uh, pressurize the Indian state as well. And, and mm -hmm. also to fight the system in their own countries, because we are all victims of the same kind of global agribusiness-led food system. And, and as Edgar already showed us what, what's happening in the U.S. in terms of mega farms and, and which are now making workers obsolete, the same kind of process is taking place. And, and, and at the end of the day, it's the same corporations, whether it's Monsanto or whether it's Tyson, that are functioning in all our countries you know, use the rights of, of both farmers and, and of farm workers and, and basically control the food system themselves. So the global solidarity and the global social movement, particularly like Via Campesina is trying to build uh, and in alliance with other sectors as well, they're all, I would say, very critical right now. Uh, lots of, to think about lots of food for thought, Ashley Shah, to um, use a pun. Yeah. Uh, Edgar, do you have any follow-up uh, responses or questions to Ashlesha as, um, before we move on? Um, well, yeah, I think um, my question would be, um, you know, just seeing the, the amount of people that have taken the streets. Um, and, you know, that's something that we never see here um, in the United States, especially a movement that is agrarian in nature. Um, and, um, you know, you hear, we see, once in a while we see, um, you know, we don't see many protests from farmers per se. Um, and if they do, it usually takes kind of a, a reactionary, kind of a right-wing tone to it. Um, but I mean, really, mm -hmm. you know, really curious to to hear about how India has been, you know, organizing. I don't know for how long, but to see the amount of people out in the streets and that kind of salt building those kind of intersectional um, uh, that intersectional movement, um, all in support of of mm -hmm. farmers. Um, and yeah, just curious to see what kind of you know, base building has been taken in place for, I don't know, and, and for how long? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I don't know if I can do justice to it, Edgar, but I'll try. And um, I think India has, uh, since our independence, which is about in the fourth, in 1947, India has had a very strong and vibrant kind of uh, social movement culture, starting with our independence movement um, against colonialism. And so that's the kind of legacy uh, that is still impacts social movements in India. And the other, other side to this conversation is about the agrarian population. And India is still about 60% uh, people involved in rural areas, which is way larger than I think the US. And, and which is why um, they have their unions uh, and their uh, organizations, which are still quite strong, and they have a very strong membership base uh, in the rural in, in rural India. Of course, these these organizations are oftentimes in uh, based on theologies, and we also have right wing populist movements here, and uh, we also have left movements. We also have very strong farmer movements and, and farm worker movements. 
Um, and so there's a sort of a history of strong grassroots organizations and where uh, us, these uh, farmer movements have received a lot of support from allies. I think it's important to highlight that, that it's not them alone. Uh, so, for example, when it comes to feeding the people, religious institutions are playing a very critical role. And Sikh Punjab in particular, I think what it is the Sikh community deserves special mention here because they have a culture of seva or community service and they have a religious uh, or institution which is Dwara, and these are putting up community kitchens all over the farm protest site. So the feeding, for example, community kitchens, mosques by gurdwaras, by individuals. So there's a lot of alliance support. You know, in trade unions in India are also quite strong. They are also threatened. So there's we have a transport trade union which represents over 9.5 million truck and buses. They have also to stall transport across the country if farmers are not, the government doesn't listen to their demands. So we have, I think it's just the coming together of different sections of society uh, and they individually also, they have a very strong history, I think, of, of mm-hmm. organizing mm-hmm. in their own respective sectors. छड़ सारी फिकरा गांदे आए जालिम वापस जाओ 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 मिट्टी दे कण कण विचो है आंदी ऐही गूंज है जालिम वापस जाओ पहले भी कभी रोटियां बनाई थी ऐसे नहीं ये तो मोदी सरकार ने बनवानी सिखा दी सानुआ केरन स्याकाली राता ऐही सवेर दी पुकार वापस जाओ 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 जागी आवामुन खैर मनाओ सब दी ऐही हुंकार वापस जाओ सुनेगा सरकार नू सुनना पड़ेगा The song you just heard is a multimedia rendition of Bella Chao in Punjabi produced by artist Poojan Sahil and is a tribute to the ongoing historic farmer protests in India. And as an edited discussion I had with grassroots organizers Edgar Franks from the US and Ashlesha Khadse from India. To listen to the entire 40-minute discussion, please visit our archives on kpfa.org. Up next, guest producer Diana Capcabin shines a disturbing light on how the pandemic is disproportionately impacting Asian American communities in California. Diana Capcabin is a producer for the Saturday Evening News, a Filipino American she has taught in schools throughout Alameda County for for several years. During the pandemic, her focus was on campaigns um, on the primary and general elections at national and local levels and the recent Georgia election. Her current advocacy focus is on housing and rent control. As California hospitals continue to absorb an influx of critically ill patients, many Southern California hospitals are reportedly at near or no capacity. Los Angeles County has fewer than 50 available intensive care unit beds, half of which are reserved for pediatric patients. To make matters worse, the pandemic has predictably hit particular vulnerable communities in Southern California. Nenez Ponce has a master's degree in public policy from Harvard and is a researcher and professor at UCLA's Public Health and Health Policy Department. And she leads the largest state health interview survey in the United States. Her expertise contributes to the elimination of racial, ethnic, and social disparities in health and health care. Ponce says that our societies demand for certain types of, quote, essential services, 
unquote, has led to Los Angeles' particular pattern of community spread. Our hospitals um, in Boyle Heights area in Los Angeles, which is um, the east part of Los Angeles, and it serves a, a predominantly Latino low-income community, um, and also believe um, uh, Martin Luther King Community Hospital, uh, which serves um, South LA, uh, again, predominantly low-income, I'd say African-American community. I think that those hospitals, some places also didn't have enough oxygen. Uh, I think it's it shows that there's just um, so much more of a like demand in those places um, for services because infection rates um, are high in those areas. And looking at I'm just I'm looking at the LA County COVID nineteen surveillance dashboard right now, which has the case rates and the death rates by communities in Los Angeles. So um, Boyle Heights area is one area that has um, high case rates and high death rates. Um, and um, there's definitely like places in um, Los Angeles where these community hospitals are serving, where they are just, you know, to the limit of, um, if not over the limit, you know, putting some of their patients in the cafeteria and gift shops. Yeah, for example. Uh, so I think it just it just shows that these hospitals are um, just really strapped because the because the virus uh, is is uh, you know the pandemic is really at the worst in those areas in Los Angeles. It's both a um, immediate story of many of these um, communities have residents who are essential workers in delivering your Amazon product, you know, essential workers. So not just the frontline health workers and delivering your food, grocery workers. Uh, so it becomes then this janitorial staff. So these essential workers then tend to be, um, you know, from communities of color. And then the other is LA. I think a lot of people think LA is so vast, you know, with 10 million people, but it's quite dense. Um, and there are pockets in Los Angeles where there's overcrowding, ho- overcrowded housing and multi-generational families, particularly among immigrant communities, uh, particularly among poor communities. So it's trying to cope, you know, with affordability of housing. So this then creates both, you know, a susceptibility and a spread um, for um, these households. Uh, and again, like multi-generational households um, is highest among um, Asian and Latino families. And these areas have, um, you know, larger household sizes. So I think it's it's this confluence, like this perfect storm of the immediate need that we have of continuing some of these quote, essential services, and that a lot of uh, the people who live in these poorer areas also do not have the luxury of working from home. Um, So the Filipino nurses population um, were especially hard hit. There's a study on registered nurses and and where Filipinos are only about 4% of registered nurse population, they're over 30% of the deaths. Uh, so it's, um, so there's all these things, you know, all these statistics that we hear, but yet they don't make it to the decision-making criteria as the next population. Why do you think that is? The Filipinos are so high as nurses. Oh, that's what we're actually working on right now, this group this group that I helped start. I, th- I think part of it is there is a high proportion of Filipinos are in healthcare. In fact, I know that there's a study that shows Filipino immigrant nurses, you know, tend to work in ICUs. So then you've got the exposure, right, to ICUs. And then again, some reports, um, some coverage that say that Filipino nurses feel like they're discriminated against at times in getting the PPEs. So then you've got, you know, exposure, you have high proportion working in ICUs, stories that say that they're not um, getting or have to reuse, you know, masks, 
of use PPEs. So then increasing the susceptibility of getting the disease. And then also, particularly among immigrant nurses, they tend to be older. And they tend to be older because, you know, maybe it took longer to pass the exam, you know, because they immigrated um, later. They tend to be older because they tend to work longer, you know, through past re- typical retirement age. So Roots of the Philippines being a former colony and actually actually bringing in um, Filipino nurses to um, fill our nursing shortages in the United States. So it's it's a very sad and long story and untold, not cemented in administrative data where a lot of the policy making um, inputs you know, are in place. Um, some systems are in place that have been historically racist and currently racist. And so ensuring that also race perhaps can be part of this uh, allocation criteria. Because typically most government policies you know, you know, are income-based and place-based, but not necessarily race-based. I'm hopeful that there could be a really... Um, careful and thoughtful conversation on thinking about incorporating racial equity in these health equity allocation decisions. Science, engineering, and medicine framework is that um, these are um, the Latino, Latinx population, um, Black, African, American, um, American Indian, Alaska Native populations, and the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population. So it's, it does not include the Asian population. And part of that, when you look at the state statistics, the Asian population is not rising to the top necessarily in terms of risk uh, in cases and in deaths. Um, however, I think part of what I actually look at a lot are, as I've said, overlooked populations. And sometimes they're overlooked because the data doesn't show you know, doesn't tell the story in Hawaii where they do disaggregate among Asians, uh, Filipino deaths are the highest. So I think that there's also these kind of untold, undetected priority populations that these vaccine allocation task forces have to be aware of and thinking about, you know, who's next, that they have to make sure that they, they have available information on who is at risk that may not be detected who's at risk. So that's one. Um, And then my other point is that um, I think having another overlay of multi-generational households or number of people in the household so that a healthcare worker who gets vaccinated, um, who comes from a multi-generational household, that the rest of their household would be up in that list of priority populations. So I think that that would be another, um, I think another decision criteria to consider. Although California state data exists for a few minority groups, Ponce says 
that the decision-making criteria does not include overlooked populations where there are high rates of death occurring within Los Angeles County's dense population where wide racial and income disparities exist, that the vulnerability of Filipina nurses exists because of historic racial, economic, and social reasons not widely understood or acknowledged by the Department of Health. According to Ponce, California's COVID-19 response, including vaccine distribution, should also be based on untold, undetected information that UCLA is currently investigating. From the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine framework is that um, these are um, the Latino, Latinx population, um, Black African American, um, American Indian Alaska Native populations and the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population. So it's it does not include the Asian population and part of that is because you know, when you look at the state statistics, um, that you know, the, it's not the Asian population is not rising to the top necessarily in terms of risk uh, in cases and in deaths. In Hawaii, where they do disaggregate among Asians, uh, Filipino deaths are the highest. So I think that there's also these kind of untold, undetected priority populations that these vaccine allocation task forces have to be aware of and thinking about, you know, who's next, that they have to make sure that they, they have available information on who is at risk that may not be detected who's at risk. So that's one. Um, and then my other point is that um, I think having another overlay of multi-generational households or number of people in the household so that a healthcare worker who gets vaccinated um, who comes from a multi-generational household that the rest of their household would be up in that list of priority populations. So I think that that would be another um, I think another decision criteria to consider. Some communities uh, more towards the you know the West and there's affluent communities where you're seeing very very low case rates, very low death rates, and then you have this extreme of you know, even way above the average that you're seeing in the state statistics. So this inequality and the disparities that are happening really I think just show how much that there's been um, a lot of social disparities um, in LA, um, as I'm sure as many other places. And it's, um, I think it's, I think it's just a call to really try to understand then um, that, you know, first of all, health insurance coverage as well uh, is even though we have the Affordable Care Act, um, immigrants and um, non-citizens who may not who may not be able to, you know, enroll in Medi-Cal, for example. So you've got coverage, health care coverage disparities. Um, you have food insecurity disparities. Um, you have housing stability um, disparities. So all of these are just kind of basic, essential needs that I think if we had done a better job in trying to address that prior to the pandemic, that um, perhaps, you know, some of these um, hot spots that we're seeing that are dividing uh, you know, communities, you know, by color, dividing them by um, by socioeconomic status, that some of that, you know, may not be as pronounced as what we're seeing now. This pandemic has has really put that, you know, right in front of our faces. I think we've, we've said that in kind of very academic terms, um, but now we're, see- we're seeing that day to day. I think also the Biden Harris administration is 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 going to do its best to preserve the Affordable Care Act, and again that gets that gets at ensuring that um, that there's coverage to as 
many um, people, any families, children as possible. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that I think, again, it's going to be more equity centered. It's, it's going to be a tough job kind of you know, dealing with this pandemic. Um, but I do think that thinking about um, allocation of resources, um, both from, you know, what is the most effective, you know, like should you go to the most, you know, afflicted places, the most populous places is really important. But in addition to, you know, for example, vaccine allocation is going to go to, you know, frontline healthcare workers and then um, nursing home residents. And also acknowledging that um, some systems are in place that have been historically racist and currently racist. And so ensuring that also race perhaps can be part of this uh, allocation criteria, because typically most government policies, you know, you know, are income based and place based, but not necessarily race based. I'm hopeful that there could be a really um, careful and thoughtful conversation on thinking about incorporating racial equity in these health equity allocation decisions. Some community social justice organizations have known for many years about the vulnerability of certain types of social, cultural, and age groups inside underdeveloped or neglected urban pockets of Los Angeles's vast, diverse landscape. Extreme income equalities were present before the COVID-19 pandemic began taking lives. Although the Biden administration may be more receptive to existing healthcare access barriers, the challenge for the state government may be how to quickly institutionalize health programs and structures that can adjust to the rising death rates of the sickest, oldest, and most neglected people of color, races, and ethnicities. Here is Ponce describing California's health equity metric. Is anything being done to specifically target the hotspots of the pandemic? There's a health equity metric that is imposed on counties um, that they have to meet. Um, so you know that there are these tiers, you know, purple being the worst. And to go to a less restrictive tier, you have to meet, say, the test positivity rate has to be a certain level before you can go to the next tier. For the Blueprint for a Safer Economy, I believe, I can't, I think it was September that there was a health equity metric that was an additional criteria to move into a less restrictive tier. And this health equity metric is based on um, the Healthy Places Index where the poorest geographical area uh, through this Healthy Places Index, so the sickest places also had to meet the certain criteria for on test positivity rates, for example, before a county could move to a less restrictive tier. So it wasn't just the average, but it also was you want to make sure bottom sickest quartile in this health, healthy places would get to that point. In principle, it assures that if a county has resources and they have to decide how to allocate them, then it behooves them to focus and target you know, the sickest places in, in the county. I believe California may be the only state that's uh, that has this health equity metric. So I think that there should be some, you know, income support as well support to landlords so that they would allow then their renters, you know, to waive um, you know rent. It's so tied to the economic recovery, you know, um, getting out of this pandemic, as we're seeing, everybody has to be healthy. In this pandemic, in order for us to get out of it, everybody has to have the chance to not get sick and not die for the entire population to get out of this. And so I think universal coverage 
would be one. And then just ensuring that there's the basic needs of food and housing security, the stimulus to families, regardless of immigration and documentation status, is one way of, of fighting you know, the pandemic. You have to ensure that everybody has the right to access health care if they are sick, and the right to access tests. And if you have these barriers because of you know, your immigration status or documentation status, then you're not going to stop the pandemic that way. So you need that universality of access to care to ensure that there is, um, you know, that people are going to get tested, that people with people who have symptoms, that they're going to get care, and that um, when they get care, that, you know, it's that the coverage is there to ensure that they get quality of care. California's counties have a data-driven way to target populations that are disproportionately suffering from adequate health care access and deaths based on pre-existing conditions. While a Biden administration has said its COVID-19 pandemic response is a top priority, there are other challenges. These are in whether universality of health care, housing, and economic needs will be quickly met effectively and efficiently enough using public health measures that have succeeded in other countries. Perhaps COVID-19 eradication may also depend on the Biden presidency's willingness to agree and work for universal health care and economic assistance so that every person has a chance not to die, as Professor Ponce said. In Berkeley for Pacifica KPFA Apex, this is Diana Cabcabin. Thank you, Diana, for producing this piece for Apex Express. That brings us to an end to tonight's show. I've been your host and producer, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. Uh, for a fuller version of the discussion that I had um, with Ashlesha Khatse and Edgar Franks, please visit our archives on uh, kpfa.org. A big shout out to Freewilling Frank for all his able tech support. Our theme music is by Asian Crisis. Tune back in next Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific for another edition of Apex Express. Tune in Thursday, midday on KPFA at 11 a.m. for the Talkies with Chris Welch. Followed by Doug Henwood covering the world's economics and politics on Behind the News at noon. Hear in-depth author interviews along with interviews devoted to the arts on Book Waves, Art Waves at 1 p.m. with Richard Walensky. Followed by the Visionary Activist Show with Caroline Casey at 2. That's every Thursday, midday at KPFA and KPFA.org. Maybe you've been listening for years, even decades, and you appreciate how important KPFA is in your life. If you're a forward-thinking donor who wants future generations to benefit from KPFA's and unhindered creativity, then join KPFA's Legacy Circle and include KPFA in your will or living trust. For details, visit our website at kpfa.org. Thank you. Betty Lou Cutter. Douglas Brent Roden. George Marcus. Valerie Anton. Anne Rosenbrook. Join our community of local heroes who have stepped up and become sustaining members of KPFA. Can we count on you to become a sustaining member who donates monthly, which helps us lift the voices of the Bay? Join the campaign to support this independent media outlet and reinforce our 70-year history of speaking truth to power. Join us. Join our community and become a KPFA sustaining member and help cut additional days from our fund drives and help us stay as vigilant as always. Thank you. Sandra Carmichael. Lou Preston. Brenda Salcedo. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 
97.5, K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Good evening.